waiting for anyone else. So, <coughs> cool, thanks everyone for coming. See you all here. Um, my name is Greg, and I'm going to be talking about so we've had open data in Python. Um, basically, I'm going to be talking about um, two projects that I've been working on for the last eight months or so that are in the civic tech space. Um, so I am a, I'm a consulting software engineer. Um, I've, been, I've been doing sort of consulting work for a little over a year. Um, I spent a good few years in corporate and decided I want to do something different, so I stepped away from that. Um, and I've been doing more and more work inside the, the civic tech space, and I'll sort of detail what that means in a bit. Um, so I've been working very closely with Perp South Africa, and these, both of these two projects were done um, through funding from Media Monitoring Africa, and I'll also talk about uh, what they do. Okay, so the civic tech movement um, is, is sort of kind of new. It's been around for a couple of years only. Um, it's, it's been pretty big in the States and in Europe, and it's starting to sort of catch on here. Uh, there's, there's Code for America, there's Code for Europe. Um, Tim O'Reilly does a lot of talk around Gov 2.0. Um, it's that whole sort of space. Um, Google defines civic as relating to the duties or activities of people in relation to their town, city, or local area. Okay, so it's, it's citizens dealing with their local environment. Um, often we talk about it in terms of government and activism. So my working definition of civic tech is technology that aids civic engagement, education, empowerment, in, um, improves transparency and accountability. Okay. So um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take um, groups that work with civic organizations or nonprofits and stuff like that um, and help them do a better job, be more effective, be more cost effective through the use of technology. And please, like, give me a give me a shout if you've got any questions as we're going along. Um, <clears throat> so the first project I'm going to talk about is called Dexter, uh, and this was a project that uh, Media Monitoring Africa um, (MMA) they needed to fulfil their remit over the 2014 elections. So what MMA does is they monitor the media in in particular in South Africa. They're based in Joburg. They've been around since about '93, um, but they also do it in Southern Africa. And so what they um, did leading up to the national elections, they wanted to answer a few questions about how the media covers elections in South Africa. So they wanted to know, was it balanced and fair, the coverage? Was it comprehensive? And was it people-centered? Right? So I'm going to start off with what they actually produced as their outcome, and then we're going to work backwards, and I'm going to talk about how we, how we did it. Uh, so they put together about a week after the elections, they had a report that's online, I'll, there's, a, there's a link to it later, that answered a whole bunch of those questions, well those three questions and a bunch of more questions. There's a, really a lot of detail here about what the media did leading up to these elections. Um, the media was monitored for a period of about eight weeks, I think, maybe 10 weeks, um, leading up to and just over the election. So here's one of the examples. <coughs> they have, um, We've got here, the blue line is the, the votes received, and the black line is the percentage of media coverage that that party got during that time period for, um, for, for media relating to elections. Did um, it cover radio as well? Uh, it did. I'll talk about exactly what, what it covered there in a second here. Um, so you can see there's a rough correlation to, uh, except for the huge outlier at the top, rough correlation <laughs> to, uh, between votes and party coverage, which, which makes a certain amount of sense. Right. Um, if we assume that votes are talking about uh, what people, the parties people are interested in, then the media should be catering to that to some extent. Those are the top three parties in terms of votes. If we zoom down into the two smaller parties, it's a bit different, right? These two parties got substantially more media coverage than votes. I mean, nothing was saving a tongue there, right? They were doing. Um, that was one of the things that came out of it. That's very simple. Right, that's really, really basic. You, you just basically need to say, well, what party was mentioned across all of our articles? That's pretty straightforward. One of the things that's actually more interesting and in what Media Monitoring Africa focuses on is who speaks in the media, what they call sources. So when you have an article um, talking about campaigning or something, who is quoted for that article? Who is contacted as a source of information for that article? So 
this shows the, um, the political figures that were most quoted throughout that whole election coverage period. Jacob Zuma at the top there, then Helen Ziller, then Julius Malema, and then Lindsay Maimai, right? Those were the top four quoted people. Everyone else was, was um, less than that. Again, this kind of lines up with, with party lines in, in our country. So this makes a certain amount of sense. Um, I do think it's interesting though that we've got two from the DA there. And that really indicates how much um, the DA was doing campaigning with Muzi in, in Gauteng. Um, and he was talking a lot in the media. Um, <clears throat> so one of the questions was, is it, uh, is it balanced and fair? So there's politically balanced and fair, there's racially balanced and fair, they've got a whole bunch of details on that. And one of the interesting ones is it's gender balanced. So our country is roughly 50-50, male-female. Um, does the media reflect that? Or do the sources in the media that the media quotes reflect that? No. Okay. Um, our government actually does a fairly good job at uh, male-female representation, but certainly in terms of quoting in the media, that doesn't happen. So this is overall. If you trim that down to just the A and C, it should be um, even worse than that. It's about half uh, the female percentage, about 12% female. But if you look at the DA, it's actually slightly biased more towards females because they've got Lindy, well, they have Lindy Wey Mazabuko and they've got Helen Zilla. Um, okay, so those are just a quick sample of some of the really interesting things that are going, that, that they're able to draw from that report. So to actually put that together, we use the Dexter web app. Um, we went through about 7,500 articles there, over 55 media outlets. 28 were prints, and a lot of those prints have online presences as well, so that would be uh, the Mail and Guardian, say. Um, 11 radio, 13 TV, and three exclusively online, such as the Daily Mail. Okay, so there's a somewhat blurry example of what a, of a Dexter screen looks like, and basically, so it's a web app. Um, <coughs> what it allows a monitor to do is say, here's a URL from the Mail and Guardian in this case, and the app goes out, it grabs that article, it extracts a bunch of information. So it pulls the article text, it pulls a summary if it has one, we know who the journalist is, we know when it was published, um, and then we run some analysis on it. Okay, uh, we picked up here that there's some people of interest, so we've got Jasper Zane, we've got Jacob Zuma, they're in there, um, it thinks education department did something interesting, it's picked up the ANC. It also pulls out, because now we're interested in these people who are quoted, it pulls out Quotations and it tries to link those to uh, to, to the um, the person who, who said it. We get a bunch of other information around the source, and you can see that here. So we've got a source. Um, we know he was quoted. He's a representative, and that we, we call that his function. And we've got a party affiliation. So this is how we start saying, okay, well, how much airtime did a political party get? It's based on the sources that are um, that speak on behalf of that party. Now we capture the, 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 um, the function that representative there because sometimes Jacob Zuma say he's speaking on behalf of the ANC and sometimes he's speaking on behalf of the presidency. And those are two different things that need to be captured. So we can't just say, well, it's one person, therefore X, Y, Z. Um, okay, so we can see here that we've got a, a few interesting things highlighted there. So, Let's actually talk about the code and what we've got out there. So it's a Flask application, um, Python Flask framework, the minimalist uh, web framework. Um, there's a MySQL database that backs us. We, we store the, the articles in there, we store all the, the sources and all the metadata in there. And then to actually do this interesting processing, we use a little bit of, a little bit of magic, a little bit of uh, lab Flask science there. Um, but we use two APIs, OpenCalA and Alchemy API. They do very similar things, and we simply merge their results. Okay, so what they let you do um, is you give them a text of an article and they pull out entities, so they'll try and identify entities, they'll try and identify interesting keywords, they'll also do those quotations. Okay? And it turns out humans are actually very important in this process as well. Okay, so in terms of sources, as I said, we, we want to know the name of the source, the gender, the race, their political affiliation and their function. So we've got a, a quotation here. For well, the first time in Ronnie Castro's life, he can't unequivocally tell people to vote for the ANC. Quote, I have been a person who was so involved in mobilization for ANC votes, he says. So if we take this and we throw it at those two APIs, this is what they tell us. It's pretty good, right? It picks up that there's Ronnie Castro's, that's interesting. It links it to he, so we can infer a gender here. 
Um, and it picks up that quotation. And it knows that that quotation is linked to him. It's not just an arbitrary piece of text that's in double quotes, for example. So in that case, it worked pretty well. It's, this is a difficult problem. It's actually not perfect. So for example, here, in an interview, Jim said, this is Urban Jim, said the ANC only wants to use Bavi to gain support for the election. Picked up Bavi, it missed Jim, and it said they are doing it for elections. He said, and it quotes, it, it, it attributes that quote back to Bavi when it actually comes from Jim. Okay, so it gets it wrong. This is why we need to bring humans into it. The other thing it's doing, I mentioned earlier, the other thing it's doing is not just picking up quotations and stuff like that, it's also picking up uh, entities like the ANC and stuff like that. And again, it's, it's pretty good in many cases. It, it knows that the Electoral Commission of South Africa is ent an entity. It picks up black consciousness movement, even though that's quite rare. It thinks fearless prosecutors, an interesting entity. <laughs> maybe it's, it's a rare combination of words, right? Or maybe not so rare in our political coverage, but it was there. But then it also thinks theft is pretty interesting. So <laughs> there's, some, there's some dirty data here, right? So we've got to throw in humans and use those humans to augment that machine learning to just filter out some of that, uh, some of that dirty stuff. But it certainly makes a human's life much, much simpler if we can save them from doing a whole lot of typing, right? We can say to them, in all likelihood, these five people are sources in this, in this article. These three were quoted, right? And we know from previous um, processing that they're linked to the DA or they're linked to the ANC, and you can tweak those if needs be. And we think this person's male, we think this person's female. Okay, so predominantly open Calais and Alchemy API are doing a lot of that extraction for us. We do also did a, a little bit of magic. So, um, Mobile Rampele, it's hard to pronounce, it's also turned out it's hard to spell. Um, these are all combinations that we've seen. My personal favorite is Mampele Pampele. <laughs> um, so, just a little bit of simple algorithms here. Um, I just took the Levenstein distance whenever we've got a new name coming in we compared it to all our other names. The Levenstein distance is, uh, basically says, how many edits do I need to make to get one word to look like the other word? And if that's a very small number of edits, then we can say with a pretty high probability that, hey, you know what? If you change one letter here, it's gonna be the correct word. Okay, good. Change it to that and, and move ahead. That's not gonna work in some cases like Mandela. He came up with a bunch as well. Um, under various pseudonyms, right? Madiba, Tata, as well as Nelson Mandela. Um, ex-president Nelson Mandela, etc. So while we're going through this, the humans are also building up aliases. So they're informing the system and saying, by the way, Zuma is also Jacob Zuma, or Tata is also Nelson Mandela, so that um, you don't have a whole bunch of people sort of dangling and we're, we're, missing, uh, we're missing the entity. <clears throat> so for the sources, we use um, machine learning and we use um, some of the people, and actually that turns out pretty well. There are a couple of other things uh, we wanted to pull out here as well, which is uh, the topic. So for instance, that would be um, party, sort of party electioneering, uh, or is this, this piece a media and opinion piece, or is it talking about free and fair elections? Uh, what are the issues that are raised? So the, the MMA had a bunch of key issues. So is it uh, corruption? Is it service delivery? And a bunch of those things. So they want to see how these issues raised. And also bias. So they want to be able to say, is this report biased against the ANC or for the DA and that sort of thing? And that's a very difficult thing to do. It's a difficult thing to do for humans even. So all of those, that's just done manually. Humans have to go through and check it. Um, so in terms of bias, it is quite interesting the results were that actually by and large, about 90% of the media is unbiased, um, which I thought was a very interesting result. Um, so you asked earlier about the radio, right? Clearly this is not going to work particularly well for radio unless it's all transcribed. So what they did for radio and TV was, because we're not relying solely on the machine learning here, that just sort of seeds a bunch of data for each article, um, a monitor can watch um, a, a, a TV news program or they can listen to the radio and then they can just go in manually. They don't have to transcribe it. All they need to do is say, you know, it was broadcast this time and these were the primary people quoted and these are their affiliations and they're still getting the benefit of the, the, um, the larger machine learning because they can go, hey, this is Jacob Zuma, and we automatically know that that's probably going to be the NC, and he's male, and he's black, and he's, a, you know, he's in whatever function. <coughs> so we've now gone through 7,500 articles. We've got a whole bunch of interesting data here, and it's actually quite rich, 
right? So we want to be able to do things, or MMA wants to be able to do things like take the SABC as a media group, so take all of their outlets. Now, okay, what were the topics that the SABC spoke about? And when they quoted people, were they predominantly black, white? When they quoted white people, were they predominantly male or female? What parties were they from, etc.? So there's a whole bunch of ways that you want to be able to slice this data and draw reports. And in particular, the client, they have an idea of what they want, the basics, but then that, that idea obviously evolves as you're going along. So the challenge is how do we build a reporting interface that lets them do this? Given that the budget's gonna to come to an end at some point, but they're still using this, right? So we're not always going to be there to run reports for them. We, know, we want to be able to help them to help themselves. And these guys are smart, but they don't have database skills, they don't know how to write SQL, and there's a whole bunch of complicated logic under the hood behind in this database model. So what we did is there's a basic dashboard which lets them see essentially what's going on with their system. So over this date range, you can see the, the, the rate at which articles are being added, you can see how they stack up in terms of publication, you can see the users are the monitors that are actively um, capturing the articles, um, we can see what media groups they, uh, the articles are from, we can also see if there are problems with the articles. So they have some red flags, they go an article shouldn't be added or shouldn't be considered good if it doesn't have a topic or um, they've identified a source but we don't know the affiliation or the function of that source. So this is a dashboard, it gives them an idea of what's going on. They can then click down the corner there, download to Excel, okay? And, and I'm shocked to say this, like I'm not a huge Excel fan but after this project, I'm really impressed with it because if you take that data and put it in Excel, it's much easier to teach people how to use Excel than how to write SQL to create a database which they don't really understand. Right? And that's actually very powerful and it really freed us up. So rather than building a really complicated interface here that A, we have to build, B, we have to teach them how to use, we just dump to Excel. So each Excel um, spreadsheet you downloaded would have 10 to 12 sheets on it, and each sheet was a slightly different cut of the data. We also included one sheet, which is basically every single piece of data. And we, we take that, the, the heavily normalized model under the hood, we've got a bunch of um, SQL views to denormalize it so that it works well in that uh, Excel spreadsheet. Then what the client can do is they can take those sheets and slap a pivot table on. And seriously, pivot tables are cool. If you've never played with them, they are very powerful, right? You can drag and drop and do, essentially you're doing a whole bunch of, of, of relational queries across this data but you're just dragging and dropping. And clients, it's much easier to understand so they can do this themselves, right? Um, and that was a, a big learning point for me because I really didn't want to spend a huge amount of time, as I said, building a complicated reporting interface when actually we need to focus on getting the data out so they can do the reports that they need because they're going to be doing reports, ongoing reports now for the next six, eight months. They take this data and they feed it back to the media houses. Um, so they need to be able to do things even when we're not around digging deep into their do you have weighting for, like, for instance, is TV weighted higher than Daily Maverick? <coughs> uh, no, it's all considered equal. Surely that's wrong. In what sense? A lot more people watch TV than read Daily Maverick. That's a fair point. Okay, that's a fair point. So, no. Um, we, we defer to Media Monitoring Africa here. They've been doing this for a while. They said it's considered equal. Um, th that's a fair point, though, in terms of readership. Um, I guess you could argue, though, yeah, I don't know. I was going to say maybe you can argue that the it doesn't matter how many people read it, it still needs to be accurate. But, but good point. So it's also about bias in the media. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily the effect of the media, but what the media is generating. So if the SAB TV is biased towards one of you, this would it would be reflected. So the media monitor would need to catch that. So I put that out. Sure. <laughs> um, Yep. Is there any sort of enforcement uh, sort of that uh, only one monitor handles one report, or you know, if multiple people touch the same report, is there some so a single combined? document, a single article can only be analysed once. So, um, and if one, when one monitor adds it, they're the only ones, as well as an admin, who can actually change that article or change the analysis. So yeah, it kind of stops different monitors from stepping on each other's toes without needing a huge permissions model. Okay. Um, so yes, there is that. It also means you can take um, an article, you can do analysis, because they're going through a lot of articles here, right? The, 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 the people managing it can't manage absolutely everything. It means they can find an article, they can come back, they can say, okay, who added this? 
while that analysis looks weird and reach out to them and say, hey, what's going on? As opposed to going, well, it's a free for all, anyone can edit an analysis, and then you actually have to keep an order trail of who, who made you. Were you also scraping all the publications for all their articles, or were the monitors finding them by themselves? Um, so we weren't, we weren't proactively scraping. The monitors are finding the articles. It's one of the things we looked at doing was just going out and just basically pulling down the entire country's worth of media, which is not a huge challenge, actually. Yeah, and then would you also to do that? Yeah. Uh, a, it's against some terms of services, so you actually need to be sort of cozy up to some of the media houses, which is not a problem. Um, these guys have good relationships with, with all of them. Um, but also the challenge there is how do you identify an election article? Right? These are, these are all election articles, so when we're ignoring sports, we're ignoring you know, anything else that wasn't to do with elections. Um, but yeah, that's actually one of the things they want to do, is do that more proactive when you look down. Um, so that's Dexter. I don't want to take too long on it because there's a whole other project to talk about. Um, let's see what the time is like. Um, basically, human augmented machine learning for media analysis, entirely open source. Um, we're going to be keeping, uh, we, we, we're going to keep building on it for, for MMA. Um, and I really recommend taking a look at the elections24 mediamonitoringafrica.org. That's their, their report. In the previous years, they put out PDF reports. Um, these, now this is a, it's a presentation that's available online. It's got some really interesting stuff. Um, one of the things that was highlighted was it is is gender inequality. But the other piece of it, which I found sad, is um, they looked at the topics. I don't, don't have a graph for it, but the, the, the report does. And they looked at the topics covered, and by far the big topics covered are um, just party electioneering um, and party squabbles and party politics. Right? There's very little coverage of service delivery issues, um, party manifestos, party promises, accountability in terms of if you've been in power, you know, did you fulfill your party manifestos from the previous elections? Basically none of that. Um, and what I liked about doing this project is um, Media Monitoring Africa, as I said, they've been around for a while. They've got good relationships with the media houses. They take this data and they feed it back to the SABC. They feed it back to Mail and Guardian. And they can say to them, hey, why, you know, you should be looking at these details. The media should be encouraging discussion around personal issues. They shouldn't just be covering who's the loudest speaker, you know, is it Julius Malema, is it Zuma or whatever. They should actually be trying to draw the public and say, well, you know, hold your party accountable if you're asking for service delivery make sure you get it. So hopefully that feeds back in our next elections, the media coverage is better and those questions are asked. Um, any other questions on, on that? I'm happy to take some more, but there is another project to talk about. Cool, let's push through line and four. Okay, the next one is, uh, is Wazi, from the Zulu and the Kosa word for knowledge. Um, I said earlier that the gender split in South Africa is 50-50. It's not, actually. It's, it's I think, 48.7 and 51.3 or something. And I kind of know that detail because I've been spending a lot of time with census information, which is exactly what this is for. So the goal behind WASI, it's a fork of a project called Census Reporter. So I can take no credit for making this look pretty. Um, and I'll show it to you now because it's a very cool tool. Um, we just um, made it work with South African data, but basically the idea is that you can understand your country and your province and, and where you live through the eyes of the census. Okay, and it turns out there's a really great data there from Stafford Bay. They've done a really good job of making that available. It's complicated data. You can, when you get it from them, you can download basics online. If you want the detailed data, it's two DVDs worth of data. Um, we also got election data from the IEC. Again, they've done a really good job in the last few years of making that available quickly and it's in reasonable formats and it's, it's accurate as far as we can tell. We combine all of that with um, boundary data from the demarcations board who I didn't know existed before this. They draw lines in our country, right? And we get this awesome app on the right. So really the best way of doing this is to, uh, to show you a demo. So this is where we hope it all works. going full screen is going to help. <laughs> okay. okay, so as I said, the idea is to explore where you live. So you can come here, you can actually type it in a place. So There we go. 
worked. Okay, so what we're doing there in the background is we're taking that address, we're going to the Google Maps API, we're doing a, um, a geocode. It sends us back lap long coordinates of where it thinks that place is. Um, we then go to another API and we map that to a ward. Um, and that's what it comes back. So uh, where we are right now, we're in ward 77. Okay. So what I'm actually going to do though is I'm going to start by diving into South Africa and we're going to take it from the top. And I'm very glad nobody's on their phones. That's awesome. It's completely mobile friendly. Like I can take no credit for it. The site is awesome. Um, and it's worth looking at on your phone. Okay, so what we've got here is we've just got a brief overview of South Africa, okay? Uh, we've got 50 million people. The screen is a bit wider. There's a bit more of a map you can see there. Um, we've got the election coverage from the 2014 election. Um, we pulled in some data there from uh, the from Dexter, from the, the media coverage. So we got the, the gender coverage there as well as the, um, the party coverage. And then we've got some information, okay? And this really, for me, started showing me what our country was like, right? As, as a sort of middle upper class, white computer engineer, I live my life like this, and this is completely over my eyes. It's very interesting to go through, right? We have a very young population in general, but there's a huge amount of variance within that when you drill down into the, into the provinces. But in general, you know, okay, very young. Lots of people under, under 20. Um, uh, racial distribution is interesting. We've got that gender distribution. Um, what do I want to show you? Um, language breakdown spoken. I didn't know that. I thought that was very interesting. That is the primary at home language. It's not at work and it's not what people speak or are able to speak. It's what people actually speak predominantly at home. And other? And that's a very like, high, large percentage for other, right? So other, I'll, I'll actually dig into that in a bit because that is interesting. Um, other covers things like, uh, well, there are a bunch of other languages there. We've got 11. Uh, we've also got things like if, if you're a German speaker in the city bowl, then it'd be different. No. Um, we've got a whole bunch of households. We know information on, you know, how many are headed by women, how many are headed by people under 20 years old. They're running a household and they're under 20. That's a large number. It's a very small percentage, but it's a large number physically. Right? Even even in the wealthy provinces and the wealthy municipalities, that number is remarkably large. In the city bowl, they're 20. We get nice things like who owns what, okay, and I'll dive into that. Uh, which one are we going to start with? Okay, we're all geeks here. Let's scroll down. Service delivery, toilet facilities. I call this one out because it's it's shocking how many people have no access to any toilets in this country. Um, there's employment. In, uh, Income breakdown, so I'm going through this very quickly, but I'll get into some of the details now. Okay, so if any of you guys are entrepreneurs and you're coming up with an idea and you say, cool, I'm going to build an app for XYZ, bear this number in mind. Only 35% of our country has internet access. In the first world, in America, that number is like 80, 90%, and it's flatlined, right? It's, it's, it's not growing anymore. Their penetration is basically done. Ours is only just starting, but it's still very low. And look how many people there have access to the internet predominantly from a cell phone. So very few people have an internet, but most people who do have a cell phone, okay? But the question then is, okay, what type of cell phone, et cetera? We don't have numbers on that. Um, so it's, there, there's some challenges, actually, I passed over the one employment, okay? That number looks very low. And people are gonna jump up and down about that. What we're doing here is we're taking this two DVDs worth of census information, but we're trying to present it in an understandable way, which is a challenge. So there is a certain amount of interpretation. Okay? So we're also relying on how Stats SA defines employee. Okay? So this is, um, this is all technically workers aged 15 and over. Why 15? I'm not sure. It's the way they've done it. Um, and employed people are people who went to a job I think it was in, the, in, in two to three weeks leading up to the census. So even if, okay, if you're at home sick, you're counted as well. But um, if you're a discouraged work seeker, does that count towards employment? And there's a lot of, there's political controversy around actually how you define it. So I'm not sure how to present that number effectively because that claims that we've got 60% unemployment, which is not what Stats SA says. They say kind of 40% unemployment, but then where's the missing 20%? I'm not sure. So, Interpreting this stuff is challenging. Um, 
we're doing our best, but what we're trying to average person, right? And in particular, this tool, which I didn't mention, this tool is aimed at reporters, actually. The idea with Census Reporter and with WASI is that a reporter can go, okay, I've got a story out in this strange area, like right in Clockwork. Look up Clockwork. What's going on in Clockwork? Who lives there? What is their income like? What are the racial demographics and all of those things? What language do these people speak? And you can use that to inform a discussion around what your article is looking at. Um, I, I, I've spent a huge amount of time just playing with this data and going through it because it's fascinating to look at. I love building tools where I can actually also play with them as well. It's, I really, go take a look at it. It's, it's awesome. So let's dig into some of the details because that's fun. Um, okay, let's take a look at that, that internet access. Okay. So we can show the data. We don't just get percentages. Okay, We can get uh, full, full data there and we're going to say let's view the table here. Um, and I'm going to look at the distribution of that data. But first, what I'm going to do is divide South Africa into municipalities. Okay, so we get some nice info here, and they've done a great job making this cool. So, um, here, the, here the numbers around sort of cell phone coverage is high. Um, and th this, that at home one is interesting. Okay, so who has internet access predominantly at home? Right at the bottom, Eastern Cape, very few people have internet access access at home. Western Cape, man, there are lots of people sitting at home playing on the internet and using the Western Cape. Yeah, right. Stellenbosch, Cape Town, Meisner, it's awesome, right? We're really privileged lives here. Then I want to, let's put this on a map. First, I'm just going to tweak this because this mapping stuff is uh, not out yet. I've been working on it over the last few days, so it's lying on lots of work. Okay, on the desktop, that box is much smaller, but, but let's look at that. So let's say I want to see no access to the internet. Okay, so you can see at the high end here, we've got 88%. That's the bulk of our country has no access to the internet. Okay, with the exception of Kharpe, somewhere on the Western Cape there. Right, so great. It's very, this is, I, yeah, it's great looking at this data. Stop saying that and just show you some data. Um, what else did I have here that was interesting? Um, okay, you mentioned language earlier, so let's let's go back there. Let's go back to South Africa, and I'm gonna yeah. Let's 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 go here. Let's go to the language. <coughs> Same thing, we're going to split South Africa into municipalities. Um, we're going to put this on the map. Okay, that alone was eye opening to me, right? That's Afrikaans language distribution as a primary home language, not as it's spoken, but as a primary home language, right? There is a clear divide down the center of our country. <laughs> that to me is fascinating. Um, English, man, are we red, <laughs> right? <laughs> Little privileged areas in the corners of the country, right? And you gotta love it. There's the, the old the Natal, the all the Brits, the, the ex strongholds over there. Um, if you choose some of the some of the, the African languages, you get these great ethnic areas. So Mbele, Kwanzaa makes sense in Eastern Cape, Zulu, in KZN. Those are cool to look at. Okay, uh, so not applicable is basically your language wasn't on the list, so you, you speak predominantly a different language. I'm not sure what's going on there. I'm, I'm not sure what that means, <laughs> right? What are these people speaking at home? What's going on there? Why 7% of, of, of that municipality don't predominantly speak a South African language? Presumably it's because it's right at the border. But this is what I love. Sign language. What is going on there? Okay, can't tell you, these numbers are small, right? That's 0.5% to 1.7%. I haven't shown the distribution. The median is about there, okay, 0.4%. So compared to the rest of the country, these guys see about three times the number of sign language speakers. GDT spread. <laughs> What's going on? I, I don't know. And that's fascinating. That's, that's an article just waiting to be written there, right? Are the numbers wrong? Did the, the, the census takers get something wrong there? Is it being poorly coded? 
that seems unlikely given that it's not just one municipality, like it's spread. Okay? That, that's amazing to me. In, also in terms of language, I'm gonna jump back here, back to, I'm gonna dive in. Let's go to Cape Town, okay, and I'll show you as we're zooming in. So you can also explore on the map. I could type in an address here or a province name. Um, I can also explore on the map and I can dig in. So we can get all the same data for the Western Cape. And when we're looking at a, a level that's lower than the country, I get comparisons. So I can see, I can compare that to the rates in South Africa. Um, and we get those comparisons for everything. So, you know, in terms of households, it's about 10% of all the figures of the households in South Africa. But I'm gonna dig into the city of Cape Town. I didn't even know the boundaries of the city of Cape Town before this. Stellenbosch is its own municipality, okay? And Stellenbosch is weird. It is a weird <laughs> municipality. I'm gonna dig into this wall yes. here. Okay, that's the ward we're in now, right? A whole lot of burgies on, on Table Mountain, and then Aston City Hall. Okay, what do you think the biggest language is that Cape Tonians in the City Bowl speak? Predominant home language? English. English. It's, it's English, okay? What do you think the second one is? German. <laughs> That's a good call. The biggest, the second biggest group is not applicable. So probably, I'm guessing German and French. But it might be Congolese and, and yeah. the other. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of languages in there, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure there's a nice tail distribution in there. But I'm sure the big ones are French and German. But that's fascinating to me, that the second biggest group of languages spoken in the city bowl is not a South African language. I, I ride the train, okay? And I ride third class. And um, I, even though I don't speak Corsa, I can tell when people are speaking Corsa. And most of the, a lot of the black people on the train are not speaking Corsa, all Zulu. Uh, and this is, this, is this is a city bowl. This is where people live, right? Yeah. So if you looked at, I'm sure there are interesting wards in, in the poor areas like Ubuletu and Kailiche and stuff that will have a weird distribution as well. It's not all going to be Zulu and Corsa. It's, you're going to get those same things because you're going to get these enclaves of, of, of foreign nationals. And actually the census data has information on where are you from and what's your home province, what's your home country. We're not showing any of that. Um, and I'd like to look at that and actually see, okay, how many people living in the city or, or elsewhere aren't from South Africa? No, you make evidence of the World War II. <laughs> well, there's this huge divide on the country. But in, 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 in Cape Town. Oh, in, in Cape, Cape Town. Town. Yeah. Cape Town. Okay, I don't know. Let's see if we can make that work. Let's find out. So um, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's take a look. I'm not nervous because this is outside of my demon. <laughs> um, so I'm going to remove the Western Cape, South Africa, and I'm going to remove that ward. I'm going to divide the city into wards, and then I'm going to put them on map and see what happens. Okay, so it's very blocky because I've had to hack together the map support over the last two days, and we're doing really weird quantization at that level. Um, so sorry for that, ignore that. So, okay, that's Afrikaans. I'd say that there's yeah, a really good for a <laughs> Where exactly is <laughs> um, Actually, um, okay, I'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> because it'd be awesome to divide that further, right? That's just, that's a really big wall. That seems really weird. Um, but it, it's possible. Um, Wards are strange, strange things. Um, anyway, the, the mapping and the distribution stuff is new. That's not online yet. I'm hoping to have that online in like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week. Please like take a look at this. And I, when I'm gone on a road trip up the West Coast, every, like I, I love you pull out your phone because it works well on your phone and go, what's going on here? Who lives here? What, what do they speak? It's been fascinating. And if you're a data nerd, you're gonna love this. Um, shortly, you'll be able to download this stuff as well in CSV, um, the original census reporter site. You can grab it in KML and GeoJSON. Um, and stuff like that. We're hoping to have that support. <coughs> oh, okay. Then there's one more, one more interesting thing. Let's go back to. Um, okay, let's go back to country. Let's start there. Middle South Africa. Let's take a look at the household goods. Okay, because this is interesting. So, we've got a we've got a basic sort of layout here of, of some fairly privileged goods that people have. Um, I'm sure if you're in the first world, you look at those and go, well, everybody should have basically all of these except maybe a car. Um, that number's really high, right? That's really interesting to me. Um, where is telephone, right? This is, 
his wife's cell phone is frantically trying to get into mobile business. Because that number's from, this is from 2011, that number's already halved, right? The official figures now are around 7%, okay? Um, and actually, I just want to go ahead and just show that on the map, because it's really cool to see that um, on a map. Let's take a look at the distribution first. So let's take South Africa again into municipalities. <clears throat> this is interesting to me. So, okay, we have, we have US cell phones, right? The minimum percentage of cell phone ownership in, in, in municipalities is 60%. The maximum there is 95%. And so the minimum, you're in the Northern Cape. Maximum, you're in Gauteng, okay? That's where all the cell phone people are. And let's see what it is. Gauteng, Gauteng, again, in the line there. Then we go down to landline. The minimum is 1%, the maximum, 54%, right? And again, where do you think the maximums are? Western Cape. Minimum, Eastern Cape. Sure, if you live in the Eastern Cape, it's, it's dire. If you, like if you take a look at the, the toilet facilities, I mean, there's this whole discussion around um, bucket toilets and stuff like that. The, the, the percentage, the greatest percentage of bucket toilets are in the Eastern Cape um, and in the Free State, it's nowhere near the Western Cape or anything like that. So all these issues around service delivery, like this to me is one of the powers of these, this tool is that when the media says, okay, politicians are jumping up and down and rights groups are jumping up and down as they should be around service delivery and toilet facilities, and then you know the party, the ANC steps up and says, well, it's all bad in the Western Cape. There's a tool where you can actually get this information very easily and you can go, hey, you know what? There are a very small number of, of, say, bucket toilets here. What about the rest of the country? What about no access to any toilets? Where are those? Eastern Cape. It's very interesting to look at this data. Um, okay, I don't want to, I'm happy to show more data, uh, <laughs> but that's roughly all I have. What we can do is talk about the, the tech quickly. Any other things anybody wants to look at? Where does it live online? Uh, good point, because I'm using local ones. I don't trust the, the internet. <laughs> Marty Map, let's see what it is. Okay. Um, as I said, it's mobile friendly, and if I get out of, so if I go to Northwest, it's nice and small. All the graphs change around, so it's, it's mobile friendly. You can locate yourself on the phone. You can say, just you know, find the board where I'm in right now, which is useful. Okay. <coughs> so. Behind the scenes, it's a Django app. As I said, um, this is fourth consensus reporter, so they built 90% of this. They did a really nice clean separation of presentation layer and data layer. So it is very easy for us to slice down that presentation and the data layer and implement our own data back end, just tweaking the presentation a little because they made assumptions around uh, US states and counties and that sort of thing. Um, it's Postgres and PostGIS in the background hosting our data. Um, to do that, I mentioned the um, taking lap long coordinates and converting them to a ward. That is done at Node.js. Um, there's a service that, that Code South Africa built. Um, then to draw the boundaries on those maps, that's all Topo JSON, um, that's on the demarcation board. The map layer itself is OpenStreetMap. Um, the only proprietary thing in all of this in terms of the data and the technology is the Google Maps API, which um, geocodes a, an address to a lap long coordinate. Um, and as I said, it's, it's mobile friendly. Um, and if we take a step back and we look at all this stuff and we, we go, you know what, the only proprietary part of this whole thing is one little feature that takes an address and sends it into Geocode, I think that's pretty cool. Because it's from the framework, from the technology, from the hosting, all of that stuff, including the map data, including all the census information, we didn't have to fight to get this. We don't have any special relationships with the IEC or with Stats SA. This stuff was just available. It's not, sometimes not easily available, like you have to maybe talk to them, but you can get those DVDs. They'll charge you a hundred bucks because they got it posted to you, but you can get hold of it. Um, and it's all open. Like they, they start to understand that open data is good and we're trying to push this and they start to understand that they need to put open licenses around this. So all of this data is readily available, which I think is very cool. Isn't there an open database for South African roads? I thought it was all not protected by copyright. They quite because Adrian put it all yeah. to OpenStreetMap because it was free. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of data here. 
what we needed in particular was we're not interested necessarily in, in road information, but the, the um, demarcation boundaries. Right. And OpenStreetMap had stale versions of those. Granted, we could go and upload them to OpenStreetMap. We ended up far. Um, so just in terms of that demarcation very quickly, so we have our country. It's divided into nine provinces. And believe it or not, uh, that changes. It changed in 2000. Well, the, the boundaries used in 2009 for the national elections were different to what we used for these elections and to what the census used. So in 2011, the demarcation board came up with a whole bunch of new boundaries. Well, not new, they changed very slightly. Um, and for the 2011 census and the 2014 national elections, those boundaries are the same, which is useful because it means we can show the same data on the same maps, right? I'm assuming the next elections will use slightly different boundaries, which is frustrating because I'm sure the census will do the same thing. Um, so they, the provinces are divided into districts, which nobody has ever heard of and nobody ever uses. The districts are divided into municipalities, which we kind of know, okay? Some of them have codes, some of those codes are for the bigger ones like Cape Town or CPT and but for Buffalo City and stuff. In terms of elections, that data is also broken, those, those um, municipalities are broken into wards and actually then voting districts beneath that. In terms of the census, those municipalities are broken into main places, that's something the census guys came up with, and also sub places. So a sub place is roughly like a, um, Better hook or some worse clerk, or it's a, it's a, a from blank on the word. Suburb. Suburb, thank you. Um, it's not quite. And a sub place can also be disjoint. Okay, it's a bit weird, but this is what they did. Especially in the Eastern Cape, lots of different disjoint um, sub places. Um, technically, you can get census information at that level. That's a huge amount of data, so we don't show that. We only go down to the ward level, which is nice because we can type in national or election results. We couldn't do election results at this. Um, all of that gives us, using these and the wards, we get about two million rows in our database. That doesn't include election information, which would double that roughly for all the wards. Um, and obviously if we went even, it, it explodes if we go lower than we are now because of, we get a huge number of them. Cool, so just very quick thank you to Petrus, who's a forming and he did, um, along with Riz, a lot of heavy lifting on Dexter and on, on Wazi. Uh, in particular, we spent a lot of time in Wazi downloading the data and getting it into a format that would put into the Postgres database, which is not as simple as you think. I mean, understanding it and making it work in the South African context. Um, yeah, and those are the two projects. So that's Civic Tech. Um, I've just been getting into it over the last 18 months. Um, I like the fact that I'm trying to do something that hopefully improves my country. Um, and, and if you guys are keen, if you're keen to hack on things, if you're keen to contribute, if you're just keen to help evangelize, um, give me a shout, come to our talks, we're starting to put together more talks and, and groups. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Do you know if there's any efforts to um, make legislation okay. online and open and searchable? So, <laughs> I have another project which I didn't talk about yet, which is because it's Ruby based. And it should be. Um, um, so actually there are two. Um, there are two, well, there's one big one in South Africa. There's SAFI, the South African Legal Information Institute. And they've been going for a while, and, and what they're doing is A, putting court cases online, but B, putting national legislation online. And it's a difficult thing to do, um, and to do it accurately, predominantly, well, the, the biggest issue is there's no concrete source for this information, right? And so if you, if you want to put legislation online, and we can go into detail on this if you want, if you want to get consolidated legislation, you have to get the individual acts, you have to get all the individual amendments, mm -hmm. and you have to manually consolidate them. So bodies like LexisNexis yeah. and SaviNet, they charge a whole bunch of money for access to their databases because they've done all this work, okay? My other project is called Open Bylaws. I'll punt it very quickly since I'm here. You know, I've got a captive audience. Um, I started doing this just out of interest for local legislation because a lot of that, um, like SAFI Day and, and SAVINET, they focus on national legislation, okay? So essentially what I did is um, I put together a website, I started with Cape Town, um, of all the, the bylaws, and these are consolidated. So what I did is I went through, um, 
the city, the, the city's all municipalities are mandated by, by law. They have to make these things available online. You download them, some of them are awful. They are literally PDFs of scanned images of how it appeared in the Gazette. You cannot search it, it's not OCR, it's often not OCR at all. It's a nightmare, right? It's not consolidated either. So you don't know that if you're looking at, okay, what do I do with, how do I handle animals in the city? Do I have to license my pets? You have to go and look at an entirely unrelated bylaw and because there's a slight amendment to the animal bylaw in that file. Okay, so I did all that hard work and I wrote a grammar to go through it, take all the bats, turn it into a nice document, and now you can actually read it reasonably. Um, and you get nice inline things and stuff like that. And my goal is to do this for all of South Africa, and I'm working, again, Civic Tech, I'm working with Safi to try and take this platform and use it for the national legislation as well. This is inspired by legislation.gov.uk, which have done a really great job of putting the British legislation online, and theirs goes back hundreds of years. Um, and it's handwritten. <laughs> But yes, there are projects around. Okay, so if you're interested, give me a shout. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you're <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Um, what are the existing data sets that are there? Uh, what are the data sets? Wow, that depends. What are you looking for? Um, so we're working with the city, the, the city of Cape Town at the moment. Um, they're trying to open up transportation data. So we're trying to um, work with them to do that. Um, Status has a lot of data sets which are interesting. Um, they've got what they call the general household, household survey, which is like a mini census every year. Um, they have poverty data, they have employment data. Um, so I mean, this is a big, the, the census data set is, is nice because it's big and consistent across the whole country at one point in time. Um, whereas they're releasing data on employment and, and uh, fields uh, or sectors of employment. Um, they've got inflation data. Uh, the IEC, their election is going on the whole time, actually. So the IEC has a whole bunch of election information. Um, and those are just the two, the two big bodies. Um, groups like Code for South Africa, we're working with municipal governments to try and get them to open up data, um, to try and get like crime statistics, right? I would love it if WASI became the tool when you went, well, okay, what's going on in my neighborhood? You go there and you go, okay, you know, these are the crime statistics over the last six months and they're, they're recent, they're up to date. So it depends on what you're looking for. And in general, if you know what you're looking for, we can help get it because we've got these relationships with various partners, we being code for us. Um, so yeah. Cool. So go take a look. It works. Why is your map? Let's see. Let's see.